We now continue with the second half of the 1993 opinion of the court in Shaw v. Reno. Section B. Appellants contend that redistricting legislation that is so bizarre on its face that it is unexplainable on grounds other than race demands the same close scrutiny that we give other state laws that classify citizens by race. Our voting rights precedents support that conclusion. In Gwynn v. United States, 1915, the court invalidated under the 15th Amendment a statute that imposed a literacy requirement on voters but contained a grandfather clause applicable to individuals and their lineal descendants entitled to vote on or prior to January 1, 1866. The determinative consideration for the court was that the law, though ostensibly race-neutral, on its face embodied no exercise of judgment and rested upon no discernible reason other than to circumvent the prohibitions of the 15th Amendment. In other words, this statute was invalid because, on its face, it could not be explained on grounds other than race. The court applied the same reasoning to the uncouth 28-sided municipal boundary line at issue in Gomillion. Although the statute that redrew the city limits of Tuskegee was race-neutral on its face, plaintiffs alleged that its effect was impermissibly to remove from the city virtually all black voters and no white voters. The court reasoned, If these allegations upon a trial remained uncontradicted or unqualified, the conclusion would be irresistible, tantamount for all practical purposes to a mathematical demonstration that the legislation is solely concerned with segregating white and colored voters by fencing Negro citizens out of town so as to deprive them of their pre-existing municipal vote. The majority resolved the case under the 15th Amendment. Justice Whitaker, however, concluded that the unlawful segregation of races of citizens into different voting districts was cognizable under the Equal Protection Clause. This court's subsequent reliance on Gomillion in other 14th Amendment cases suggests the correctness of Justice Whitaker's view. Gomillion thus supports appellant's contention that district lines obviously drawn for the purpose of separating voters by race require careful scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause, regardless of the motivations underlying their adoption. The court extended the reasoning of Gomillion to congressional districting in Wright v. Rockefeller, 1964. At issue in Wright were four districts contained in a New York apportionment statute. The plaintiffs alleged that the statute excluded non-whites from one district and concentrated them in the other three. Every member of the court assumed that the plaintiff's allegation that the statute segregated eligible voters by race and place of origin stated a constitutional claim. The justices disagreed only as to whether the plaintiffs had carried their burden of proof at trial. The dissenters thought the unusual shape of the district lines could be explained only in racial terms. The majority, however, accepted the district court's finding that the plaintiffs had failed to establish that the districts were in fact drawn on racial lines. Although the boundary lines were somewhat irregular, the majority reasoned, they were not so bizarre as to permit of no other conclusion. Indeed, because most of the non-white voters lived together in one area, it would have been difficult to construct voting districts without concentrations of non-white voters. Wright illustrates the difficulty of determining from the face of a single-member district plan that it purposefully distinguishes between voters on the basis of race. A reapportionment statute typically does not classify persons at all. It classifies tracts of land or addresses, 
Moreover, redistricting differs from other kinds of state decision making in that the legislature always is aware of race when it draws district lines, just as it is aware of age, economic status, religious and political persuasion, and a variety of other demographic factors. That sort of race consciousness does not lead inevitably to impermissible race discrimination. As Wright demonstrates, when members of a racial group live together in one community, a reapportionment plan that concentrates members of the group in one district and excludes them from others may reflect wholly legitimate purposes. The district lines may be drawn, for example, to provide for compact districts of contiguous territory or to maintain the integrity of political subdivisions. The difficulty of proof, of course, does not mean that a racial gerrymander, once established, should receive less scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause than other state legislation classifying citizens by race. Moreover, it seems clear to us that proof sometimes will not be difficult at all. In some exceptional cases, a reapportionment plan may be so highly irregular that on its face it rationally cannot be understood as anything other than an effort to segregate voters on the basis of race. Gomillion, in which a tortured municipal boundary line was drawn to exclude black voters, was such a case. So, too, would be a case in which a state concentrated a dispersed minority population in a single district by disregarding traditional districting principles such as compactness, contiguity, and respect for political subdivisions. We emphasize that these criteria are important not because they are constitutionally required, they are not, but because they are objective factors that may serve to defeat a claim that a district has been gerrymandered on racial lines. Put differently, we believe that reapportionment is one area in which appearances do matter. A reapportionment plan that includes, in one district, individuals who belong to the same race but who are otherwise widely separated by geographical and political boundaries and who may have little in common with one another but the color of their skin, bears an uncomfortable resemblance to political apartheid. It reinforces the perception that members of the same racial group, regardless of their age, education, economic status, or the community in which they live, think alike, share the same political interests, and will prefer the same candidates at the polls. We have rejected such perceptions elsewhere as impermissible racial stereotypes. By perpetuating such notions, a racial gerrymander may exacerbate the very patterns of racial block voting that majority-minority districting is sometimes said to counteract. The message that such districting sends to elected representatives is equally pernicious. When a district obviously is created solely to effectuate the perceived common interests of one racial group, elected officials are more likely to believe that their primary obligation is to represent only the members of that group rather than their constituency as a whole. This is altogether antithetical to our system of representative democracy. As Justice Douglas explained in his dissent, in Wright v. Rockefeller nearly 30 years ago. Here, the individual is important, not his race, his creed, or his color. The principle of equality is at war with the notion that District A must be represented by a Negro, as it is with the notion that District B must be represented by a Caucasian, District C by a Jew, District D by a Catholic, and so on. That system, by whatever name it is called, is a divisive force in a community, emphasizing differences between candidates and voters that are irrelevant in the constitutional sense. When racial or religious lines are drawn by the state, the multiracial, multireligious communities that our constitution seeks to weld together as one become separatist. Antagonisms that relate to race or to religion rather than to political issues, are generated. Communities seek not the best representative, 
but the best racial or religious partisan. Since that system is at war with the democratic ideal, it should find no footing here. For these reasons, we conclude that a plaintiff challenging a reapportionment statute under the Equal Protection Clause may state a claim by alleging that the legislation, though race-neutral on its face, rationally cannot be understood as anything other than an effort to separate voters into different districts on the basis of race, and that the separation lacks sufficient justification. It is unnecessary for us to decide whether or how a reapportionment plan that, on its face, can be explained in non-racial terms successfully could be challenged. Thus, we express no view as to whether the intentional creation of majority-minority districts, without more, always gives rise to an equal protection claim. We hold only that, on the facts of this case, Appellants have stated a claim sufficient to defeat the state's appellee's motion to dismiss. Section C. The dissenters consider the circumstances of this case functionally indistinguishable from multi-member districting and at-large voting systems, which are loosely described as other varieties of gerrymandering. We have considered the constitutionality of these practices in other 14th Amendment cases and have required plaintiffs to demonstrate that the challenged practice has the purpose and effect of diluting a racial group's voting strength. At large and multi member schemes, however, do not classify voters on the basis of race. Classifying citizens by race, as we have said, threatens special harms that are not present in our vote dilution cases. It therefore warrants different analysis. Justice Souter apparently believes that racial gerrymandering is harmless unless it dilutes a racial group's voting strength. As we have explained, however, reapportionment legislation that cannot be understood as anything other than an effort to classify and separate voters by race injures voters in other ways. It reinforces racial stereotypes and threatens to undermine our system of representative democracy by signaling to elected officials that they represent a particular racial group rather than their constituency as a whole. Justice Souter does not adequately explain why these harms are not cognizable under the 14th Amendment. The dissenters make two other arguments that cannot be reconciled with our precedents. First, they suggest that a racial gerrymander of the sort alleged here is functionally equivalent to gerrymanders for non-racial purposes, such as political gerrymanders. This court has held political gerrymanders to be justiciable under the Equal Protection Clause, but nothing in our case law compels the conclusion that racial and political gerrymanders are subject to precisely the same constitutional scrutiny. In fact, our country's long and persistent history of racial discrimination in voting, as well as our 14th Amendment jurisprudence, which always has reserved the strictest scrutiny for discrimination on the basis of race, would seem to compel the opposite conclusion. Second, Justice Stevens argues that racial gerrymandering poses no constitutional difficulties when district lines are drawn to favor the minority rather than the majority. We have made clear, however, that equal protection analysis is not dependent on the race of those burdened or benefited by a particular classification. Indeed, racial classifications receive close scrutiny even when they may be said to burden or benefit the races equally. Finally, nothing in the court's highly fractured decision in UJO, on which the district court almost exclusively relied, and which the dissenters evidently believe controls, forecloses the claim we recognize today. UJO concerned New York's revision of a reapportionment plan to include additional majority-minority districts in response to the Attorney General's denial 
of administrative preclearance under Section 5. In that regard, it closely resembles the present case. But the cases are critically different in another way. The plaintiffs in UJO, members of a Hasidic community split between two districts under New York's revised redistricting plan, did not allege that the plan, on its face, was so highly irregular that it rationally could be understood only as an effort to segregate voters by race. Indeed, the facts of the case would not have supported such a claim. Three justices approved the New York statute in part precisely because it adhered to traditional districting principles. Quote, We think it permissible for a state employing sound districting principles such as compactness and population equality to attempt to prevent racial minorities from being repeatedly outvoted by creating districts that will afford fair representation to the members of those racial groups who are sufficiently numerous and whose residential patterns afford the opportunity of creating districts in which they will be in the majority. Unquote. As a majority of the justices construed the complaint, the UJO plaintiffs made a different claim that the New York plan impermissibly diluted their voting strength. Five of the eight justices who participated in the decision resolved the case under the framework the court previously had adopted for vote dilution cases. Three justices rejected the plaintiff's claim on the grounds that the New York statute represented no racial slur or stigma with respect to whites or any other race and left white voters with better than proportional representation. Two others concluded that the statute did not minimize or cancel out a minority group's voting strength and that the state's intent to comply with the Voting Rights Act, as interpreted by the Department of Justice, foreclosed any finding that the state acted with the invidious purpose of discriminating against white voters. The district court below relied on these portions of UJO to reject appellant's claim. In our view, the court used the wrong analysis. UJO's framework simply does not apply where, as here, a reapportionment plan is alleged to be so irrational on its face that it immediately offends principles of racial equality. UJO set forth a standard under which white voters can establish unconstitutional vote dilution, but it did not purport to overrule Gomillion or Wright. Nothing in the decision precludes white voters, or voters of any other race, from bringing the analytically distinct claim that a reapportionment plan rationally cannot be understood as anything other than an effort to segregate citizens into separate voting districts on the basis of race without sufficient justification. Because appellants here stated such a claim, the district court erred in dismissing their complaint. Part 4 Justice Souter contends that exacting scrutiny of racial gerrymanders under the 14th Amendment is inappropriate because reapportionment nearly always requires some consideration of race for legitimate reasons. As long as members of racial groups have a commonality of interest, and racial block voting takes place, he argues, legislators will have to take race into account in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act. Justice Souter's reasoning is flawed. Earlier this term, we unanimously reaffirmed that racial block voting and minority group political cohesion never can be assumed, but specifically must be proved in each case in order to establish that a redistricting plan dilutes minority voting strength in violation of Section 2. That racial block voting or minority political cohesion may be found to exist in some cases, of course, is no reason to treat all racial gerrymanders differently from other kinds of racial classification. 
Justice Souter apparently views racial gerrymandering of the type presented here as a special category of benign racial discrimination that should be subject to relaxed judicial review. As we have said, however, the very reason that the Equal Protection Clause demands strict scrutiny of all racial classifications is because without it, a court cannot determine whether or not the discrimination truly is benign. Thus, if appellants' allegations of a racial gerrymander are not contradicted on remand, the district court must determine whether the General Assembly's reapportionment plan satisfies strict scrutiny. We therefore consider what that level of scrutiny requires in the reapportionment context. The state appellees suggest that a covered jurisdiction may have a compelling interest in creating majority-minority districts in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act. The states certainly have a very strong interest in complying with federal anti-discrimination laws that are constitutionally valid as interpreted and as applied. But in the context of a 14th Amendment challenge, Courts must bear in mind the difference between what the law permits and what it requires. For example, on remand, North Carolina might claim that it adopted the revised plan in order to comply with the Section 5 non-retrogression principle. Under that principle, a proposed voting change cannot be pre-cleared if it will lead to a retrogression in the position of racial minorities with respect to their effective exercise of the electoral franchise. In Beer v. United States, 1976, we held that a reapportionment plan that created one majority minority district where none existed before passed muster under Section 5 because it improved the position of racial minorities. Although the court concluded that the redistricting scheme at issue in Beer was non-retrogressive, it did not hold that the plan, for that reason, was immune from constitutional challenge. The court expressly declined to reach that question. Indeed, the Voting Rights Act and our case law make clear that a reapportionment plan that satisfies Section 5 still may be enjoined as unconstitutional. Thus, we do not read Beer or any of our other Section 5 cases to give covered jurisdiction carte blanche to engage in racial gerrymandering in the name of non-retrogression. A reapportionment plan would not be narrowly tailored to the goal of avoiding retrogression if the state went beyond what was reasonably necessary to avoid retrogression. Our conclusion is supported by the plurality opinion in UJO, in which four justices determined that New York's creation of additional majority-minority districts was constitutional because the plaintiffs had failed to demonstrate that the state did more than the attorney general was authorized to require it to do under the non-retrogression principle of beer. Before us, the state appellees contend that the General Assembly's revised plan was necessary not to prevent retrogression, but to avoid dilution of black voting strength in violation of Section 2, as construed in Thornburg v. Jingles, 1986. In Jingles, the court considered a multi-member redistricting plan for the North Carolina State Legislature. The court held that members of a racial minority group claiming Section 2 vote dilution through the use of multi-member districts must prove three threshold questions. That the minority group is sufficiently large and geographically compact to constitute a majority in a single-member district. That the minority group is politically cohesive. And that the white majority votes sufficiently as a block to enable it, usually, to defeat the minority's preferred candidate. We have indicated that similar preconditions apply in Section 2 challenges to single-member districts. 
Appellants maintain that the General Assembly's revised plan could not have been required by Section 2. They contend that the state's black population is too dispersed to support two geographically compact majority black districts, as the bizarre shape of District 12 demonstrates, and that there is no evidence of black political cohesion. They also contend that recent black electoral successes demonstrate the willingness of white voters in North Carolina to vote for black candidates. Appellants point out that blacks currently hold the positions of state auditor, speaker of the North Carolina House of Representatives, and chair of the North Carolina State Board of Elections. They also point out that in 1990, a black candidate defeated a white opponent in the Democratic Party runoff for a United States Senate seat before being defeated narrowly by the Republican incumbent in the general election. Appellants further argue that if Section 2 did require adoption of North Carolina's revised plan, Section 2 is, to that extent, unconstitutional. These arguments were not developed below, and the issues remain open for consideration on remand. The state appellees alternatively argue that the General Assembly's plan advanced a compelling interest entirely distinct from the Voting Rights Act. We previously have recognized a significant state interest in eradicating the effects of past racial discrimination, but the state must have a strong basis in evidence for concluding that remedial action is necessary. The state appellees submit that two pieces of evidence gave the General Assembly a strong basis for believing that remedial action was warranted here the Attorney General's imposition of the Section 5 preclearance requirement on 40 North Carolina counties and the Jingles District Court's findings of a long history of official racial discrimination in North Carolina's political system and of pervasive racial block voting. The state appellees assert that the deliberate creation of majority-minority districts is the most precise way indeed the only effective way, to overcome the effects of racially polarized voting. This question also need not be decided at this stage of the litigation. We note, however, that only three justices in UJO were prepared to say that states have a significant interest in minimizing the consequences of racial block voting, apart from the requirements of the Voting Rights Act and those three justices specifically concluded that race-based districting as a response to racially polarized voting is constitutionally permissible only when the state employs sound districting principles and only when the affected racial group's residential patterns afford the opportunity of creating districts in which they will be in the majority. Part 5 Racial classifications of any sort pose the risk of lasting harm to our society. They reinforce the belief, held by too many for too much of our history, that individuals should be judged by the color of their skin. Racial classifications with respect to voting carry particular dangers. Racial gerrymandering, even for remedial purposes, may balkanize us into competing racial factions. It threatens to carry us further from the goal of a political system in which race no longer matters, a goal that the 14th and 15th Amendments embody and to which the nation continues to aspire. It is for these reasons that race-based districting by our state legislatures demands close judicial scrutiny. In this case, the Attorney General suggested that North Carolina could have created a reasonably compact second majority minority district in the south central to southeastern part of the state. We express no view as to whether appellants successfully could have challenged such a district under the 14th Amendment. We also do not decide whether appellant's complaint stated a claim under constitutional provisions 
other than the 14th Amendment. Today we hold only that appellants have stated a claim under the Equal Protection Clause by alleging that the North Carolina General Assembly adopted a reapportionment scheme so irrational on its face that it can be understood only as an effort to segregate voters into separate voting districts because of their race, and that the separation lacks sufficient justification. If the allegation of racial gerrymandering remains uncontradicted, the district court further must determine whether the North Carolina plan is narrowly tailored to further a compelling governmental interest. Accordingly, we reverse the judgment of the district court and remand the case for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. It is so ordered. We've come to the end of the opinion. Until next episode, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.